Hey everyone, welcome to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. I'm Tracy Friedlander, and today for the first interview of season three, I have Giacomo Byros. Giacomo was my very first podcast guest ever back in 2016 when I started Crushing Classical. I had him on the show to talk about his daring and bold move he made from the back of the orchestra as a tuba player to the leader as conductor and founder of his own orchestra, New Deco Ensemble, and music director of the Amarillo Symphony, as well as a guest conductor all over the world. Today we talked about how his career has evolved since our last episode. He has so much to say about leadership in classical music, how to stay grounded as a founder and music director, and as a business person. You'll love this conversation as a source of inspiration for what's possible in classical music for the future. Having people like Giacomo in leadership roles is what is going to evolve it in a positive way. He shares his point of view on this, and whether you're in management, on a board, or a musician in a symphony, this conversation will be extremely valuable to you for ideas you can take to your organization and implement immediately. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Fix Music for sponsoring Crushing Classical Podcast. Fixmusic.com is your online resource for high quality and affordable sheet music. There are some new offerings at Fix available that you'll want to know about. Now there's organ music, lots and lots of choral music, as well as orchestral parts that you may need for concerts or auditions. And guess what? They're also actively working with chorus and orchestra directors to help them plan their seasons. So if you're a program director and you want some help on choosing pieces for your season you may not have already thought of, contact Fix Music through their website. And as always, free shipping on all domestic orders. Check out fixmusic.com for your sheet music needs and use the link in the show notes to receive 10% off your first order. Let's get started. You know what's funny is that you are my very first podcast guest, and now it's been two years since I started the podcast, and you're coming on for like the anniversary of two years. Woohoo! So I'm really excited it. about that. So, yeah, me too. yeah, it's so great to have you back here, Giacomo. And I know there's <laughs> you have so much stuff to tell us about um, everything you're doing new deco, guest conducting, being the concert master of the world. I mean, not, not the violin concert master, but you know what I mean. So tell yeah. me, so fill me in. Like, what have you been doing the last couple of years? Ooh, uh, last couple of years since we spoke, I mean, really kind of traveling down the same path I've been traveling, but now things have gotten just higher quality, more expanded, more selective. Um, you know, Nundeco is now entering its fourth season on a very strong and solid foundation. Uh, I'm entering my sixth year as the music director of the Amarillo Symphony, uh, which, you know, I adore my orchestra there and the community. And yeah, the guest conducting is getting really interesting and I'm being, you know, tapped to do some really fun projects and really interesting things. So I have certain relationships with orchestras that have grown over the few years and I've got some new orchestras that I'm meeting this season that are very exciting and some subscriptions that are really looking forward to overseas and and here at home and uh, living the dream you know what can i say just trying to keep walking down the path and and you know find my my way and and my niche within this this world of classical music but also trying to push it forward too and and be as creative as possible so yes and that's what i love so much about what you do and so really you do it you do it everywhere you do it in all your all your endeavors but you really really do it at New Deco. And so I want to talk about um, how things have evolved there. I know you have a really strong vision for the genre bending, just creating a totally different kind of experience at an orchestra concert. And I want to know um, how your vision there has evolved over the last several seasons. Yeah. Uh, I think we kind of like moved on from genre bending to genre lists now. Like, you know, we just... Yeah, I mean, because there's really no limitation musically anymore. There's no ceiling, there's no walls, there's no style or or genre or musical adaptation or recreation or artist that we cannot work with. I mean, I've always believed that the orchestra is the ultimate vehicle for expression. Um, I think it's the ultimate vehicle for artistic expression, emotional expression. There's really no entity quite like it. And the ensemble that we have is 
morphed now into a very hybrid like ensemble meaning while we have all the traditional orchestral instruments percussion winds brass strings we've you know really developed and 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 added the element of a rhythm section but not just any guys off the street these are some of the best players not only in miami but these are some of the most incredibly creative talented human beings i could ever want to work with and they just happen to be here in miami and they're now playing a new deco ensemble from drums to world percussion to a guitarist who writes his own music but can read any contemporary piece a bass player who electric bass player who toured with ricky martin for years and years but also was like you know played in youth orchestra so he can read and do anything and has a sensitive ear and memorizes all his music i mean it's like insane and then uh one of the cool adaptions is we brought in a cat named Jason Matthews who does a lot of different Moogs and, and synthesizer and roads and, and creates sounds that are so really otherworldly and the palette of colors and sounds he creates, uh, um, you know, are, are really, really interesting. So, um, I don't know how to explain that aspect of it as much as it's just really morphed musically and, and the colors that we can now do have, have really grown because of that the adaptation of this rhythm section as being a real core unit to the group. So every time Sam now is thinking of suites or, or rearrangements, he's like, now he's in contact with these guys. It's not just me and him anymore. Um, he's in contact with these guys about like, Hey, what kind of beat would this work? And why don't you come over to my house and we'll, we'll write some new tracks to go along. And, and the music's just really expanding and it's great for him because it gives him other people he trusts to kind of help with. But uh, yeah. it, it just really broadens our, our scope and our, our sound world. So there's really nothing more we can't do. I mean, we've done everything from Petrushka to Firebird to Porgy and Bess to Catfish Row um, to Suites of Stevie Wonder in the last few years to, you know, everything from Outcast to Daft Punk to David Bowie and Prince. So there's no more style or genre that is, is elusive to us anymore because we have this ensemble that's a very hybrid group that can break down. And also we've like, developed a smaller version of the group oh cool so yeah so like we have a 31 piece 32 piece that's like our sort of biggest variation and we use that ensemble for the main halls and the big halls like the arch center which we're now in residence with uh new world center which we're now performing in regularly um you know as the season has expanded a lot of arts institutions have really come up to support us including them and 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 so for those big ensembles and those big um, places we use the full group, but we've developed a 15 piece, like a, a smaller version. And it's really, really fun. We just toured with that group to Saratoga Performing Arts Center and played at uh, a series called SPAC on stage. And um, it went really, really well for us and it was our first tour out of state. Uh, and we, you know, traveling with 31 piece group for a one off gig is not really financially feasible. It's just expensive. You know, yeah. if we had like, six dates then that would be great and then we can kind of like take care of it but you know just with travel and instruments and people it's it's expensive orchestras are expensive yeah the way orchestras do it is they bundle up tours and each presenter gives them x amount of money fee wise and that kind of adds up and covers you but we didn't have that opportunity and and we got a call from um an old friend of mine chris shiley who used to go to peabody with me and he's now one of the artistic planners there and he's like your group's amazing can we bring up a smaller version because it would be great and we did and it was 15 piece and it was awesome and we asked a couple composers to reduce some works for the 15 piece ensemble you know it still had it had a quartet of strings and then it had clarinet trombone trumpet and then rhythm section and percussion and it just was like amazing it was just really amazing so we're very excited about that development because it gives us an opportunity to spread our brand and in, in different venues and you know now we can go into smaller spaces like you know the perez art museum or the de la cruz collection here in miami which are all institutions we've wanted to work with and have been asked to work with but you know with 31 pieces just feasibility yeah. and money you know and that's that the big version of the group takes up a lot of energy and a lot of time and you know when you put on a big concert with the big group it, you got to raise money for it i mean it's it's the whole thing but the smaller group is is something that can go into schools now and it's something that can um be of a, a like specialty group when needed so if, if the fee can't match the pay with everything if, if it's the right way to broaden our our our, our scope and and our brand then we can send a smaller group out too so. awesome okay so let i want to break down a couple of things because you just said all this great stuff about what's going on there and i want to i want to talk to you about 
first of all, I love that you were open-minded enough to break it down and take it small. Like you didn't, you didn't just go, uh, touring's not going to be possible with this big group or, or touring's not going to be possible because it's so expensive just to do one concert. But you, you worked around that and, and you created a smaller group and then you just went, even though maybe it wasn't financially, um, the best thing to do just one concert, but you, you were able to connect with people and see some more opportunities. And now you know what you know, because you did that. So I think that's really, really cool. And, um, like you said, so you, you said it helps your brand. So tell me more about how you think you're always thinking about your brand when you make choices. Part A of the question, part B, how could orchestras do that better? Ooh, yeah. Uh, well, part A, you know, for us, it's all about, you know, we feel like we've done a really good job representing who we are here in Miami. We have a following. We have a, a fervor behind us. The community is really supporting us. Institutions are really supporting us. You know, foundational support and government support and city support and county support is really coming a long way because we've not only grown as an institution and we are more eligible for things, but we've been around long enough and have had enough sustainability to show to donors and philanthropists and, and foundations that we're worthy of supporting and the kind of art and culture that we're adding to the already very vibrant scene in Miami is is worthy of the support because we're you're bringing a lot of um you know, just culture and art and sophistication to a community that's really growing and, and doesn't have a history of that. Um, you know, Miami's always been known for beaches and tourism and fashion and music and loud music and electronic music. And, and that's all still here. And that's all part of the scene. And that's really very South Beachy. But like once you come off the beach, there's this very robust, artistic, culturally uh, savvy, um, you know, music inspired, uh, just a very robust, eclectic scene here. Um, and so New Deco really, you know, fills that void in the Miami arena. But, you know, strategically speaking, we always get together in the summer and think, what's next? How do we grow? How do we expand? How do we get our, our name out? How do we, how do we tour? And why should we tour? And what's the goal with touring? And is it just to satisfy our own egos? Or is it really to spread the message of the kind of music making we're we're doing around the globe eventually, you know, and um, obviously until we get a certain amount of cachet and, and, and name recognition and, um, you know, some recordings out, which we just made our first recording in June, uh, hopefully to release either late fall, early spring, um, you know, as soon as we get that kind of going, and then sure, I'm sure presenters around the world or in other places will see the big group and think it's a, a, a it's worth it, and hopefully we can play some big venues and, and do all that, and that's definitely a dream. But with the smaller group, it gives us the chance to to really spread that mission quicker and and, mm -hmm. and, and in a more dynamic way. Uh, and it kind of came about, you know, Sam and I always thought about like a little mini version or a smaller version before. Um, you know, it, it was something that was on the mind, and then some musicians in the group sort of like kind of came together and came up with a, a project proposal that was, you know, it wasn't really rooted in, in, um, uh, you know, what they understood of how the finances work and stuff, but the idea was great and it was initiative from the musicians and, you know, it, it and it kind of fit with the idea that Sam and I had thought about already previously about something smaller. And so we just kind of like tried it out at a gig and it went well. Um, but then we realized we needed a few more pieces. Originally, it was like 12 or 13 pieces. And then we realized we need an extra percussionist and we need, you know, you know, maybe some keyboards, you know, just stuff to really fill out the sound world, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and we landed on 15 people and it's and it's it still gives us an orchestral sound. You know, it's not quite the depth and sonority of like full strings, but it still has a string sound and and it's very flexible and malleable. And we can fit on a 20 by 20 stage and 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 still have the army of instruments that we use. Yeah. Uh, now, for orchestras, I think, you know, oh, so essentially that allows us to play in venues that we wouldn't normally be able to play in, right. um, also provide opportunities for people to present us at a cheaper level and, 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 and just kind of really take the essence and core of the music making we do and, and, and put it out there in a way that's, while, of course, deep down in my heart of hearts, I want the big group, to, that, that, that big group is what really captures people and really inspires and mm -hmm and such but 
you know, we, we took this group to Saratoga and, and they have this great series called uh, SPAC on stage where they kind of flip um, the ensemble to kind of face the stage. So you're on the edge of the stage, like front down on the front part of the stage and you're playing to an audience that's actually sitting on the stage because it's a huge stage. I mean, you know, the Saratoga Performing Arts Center hosts, you know, Philadelphia Orchestra and New York City Ballet and all these big institutions. But this series they, they're doing is developing a more intimate sort of thing, which is kind of the trend in a lot of ways, as you so, know. Yeah, so um, they have the intimacy. audience sitting on the stage. Yeah, so basically like what we looked like at the light box, they recreated on stage. So it's mm -hmm. like kind of like a horseshoe around us. And uh, we had our sound team. We brought our sound guy up, and it sounded great. I mean, it wasn't exactly the kind of sound that we do at the Lightbox or at the Arts Center, but it was still had that impact, and people freaked out, and people were dancing, and people were clapping, and people were enjoying the music. It was, mm. it was really special. It just kind of told us that not only can we do this, but if we get a couple dates in a row, we may be able to actually make a little money, you know, and, 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 and take care of the whole project. Uh, eventually with the means of getting the big group to do some big touring. But again, until we have enough cachet and all that, we can't really do that. Now, I think orchestras in general understand the need to get out into the communities more. You see all these series popping up, like, you know, the National Symphony, the In the Neighborhood series, or, you know, Philadelphia, I just saw announced a new series where they're going out. And I think people are understanding that certain communities just don't get art and music and culture at that level. And, and there's a lot of... Um, work being done by those institutions to bring their orchestras to them but you know the smaller group is it's 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 harder for a big orchestra because they have rules and they have regulations and they have right. unions and they have time periods and you know uh, you know musicians are very particular and, and yep. finicky and you can't just throw 16 people together and say go it doesn't really work that way right and there's so um, many restrictions and it's like like the thing the branding thing like you like you said there's there's limits on on what people will do. There's lots of red tape. Like you, like you said, you can't just say, hey, you 10 people, go, you know, you're going to this place. You know, there's the contract and all that other stuff. I think that... Yeah, and the musicians have to like, you know, they have to be able to work together and get along. And do you yeah. have a conductor or not a conductor? You know, uh, we've always strove to create a family environment with the group. Um, and I think that will probably speak to another later question about like, what are the things I've learned? Uh, you know, a lot of it's leadership and and how you lead a group, and and a lot of that leadership is off the podium. Mm. Um, of course, on the podium, you got to really you know lead the group and inspire them and put things together. And I think the musicians of the orchestra, for the most part, totally trust me and, and feel confident in that I'm going to be a great architect for them. But I've learned to give up a lot of my own self to them so that we get a bigger, more positive response. You know, if if everything's my way or the highway, I think it's a limited, narrow a view of what the artistic heights that can be reached. And um, I think that's hard for an orchestra to kind of tap into because orchestras have a music director and they may have an assistant conductor and yeah. it's just hard. And, you know, and, 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 and honestly, classical musicians who play in big orchestras, they love playing chamber music for, you know, I feel like they, they always relish the opportunity, but there's always got to be a leader at some point. And I think that it's, you can't just though you can't just grab 10 people. It's hard. I, I can totally see how, how that could be something hard to get off. Yeah, orchestras are open to it. I mean, I'm doing certain projects with different orchestras that use smaller versions of, of the groups and, and people are really loving it. It's the intimacy people are craving. Mm. The more and more technology becomes a part of our life, the more and more technology kind of all consumes us in, in, in its beautiful and devastating ways. The more people are craving like a, a just a good old, journal to write in and right. a little pencil that's sharpened really well and you know a concert experience is going to move them and grab them and, and they can feel close to and and um, you know there's you just that's the reality of where we are and and to us we feel like that niche is really well served with our group both the big and the small so um yeah, yeah I, I i feel for orchestras you know because i know that's what they want right and the, and the audience is that respect and cherish what an orchestra does, understand that the big grandeur of it's amazing. But I'm sorry, I feel like some of the younger generations, millennials, and even the, the next generation, they want something intimate. They want something that's gonna drive them away from staring at their phone and, and, and be an experience they can feel and it's palpable and it's worthy and rich, you know, and, and they'll spend money on it. But you know, it, they'll, they'll put their dollars down to have an experience like that. That's a powerful thing to realize through the work you've done with New Deco to see that and know, like know full on, you know, that that's what people want. Isn't it great when you can find out what the audience wants? 
Yeah, I mean, we're still always, that's a very elusive thing. And I think yeah. we're, we're working on ways to, to figure that out. Obviously, we do surveys and stuff, but we've just brought on some people who are going to like really specialize in the, the, the social media and marketing aspect of, of that and how to connect us to different artists. I mean, it's, 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 there's a whole lot going on. Yes, right now, and those are my two next questions that you just kind of just named right there because I wanted to talk to you about not only your team, but um, well, let's talk about the team first because you just mentioned you've got more people working with New Deco. Like you've been able to forward it that way so that you're allowed to hire people and get help, which I'm sure feels great. So yeah. tell me about that. Well, um, I think it started out with a few like part-time hires. One was a librarian and a personal manager because a lot of it was getting really difficult to sort of stay on top of. You mm -hmm. know, our very first hire was Derek Wallace and he kind of took on the role of everything and all things. He was manager of operations and communications, which basically meant he just dealt with everything. And he was a young kid and he's very smart, very bright, believes in the mission. He's a great, great human. Um, but you know, like any person, he has capacity issues and he was like swimming all of the time, working like 60, 70 hours a week, getting paid, you know, very little because we had very little. Um, so he kind of went through that slog for a good year and a half, two years. And then we finally brought in a personal manager and librarian and she took over the bulk of music and, and, you know, uh, organizing our music, ordering our music. She took care of the, the musicianship relationships, created contracts and, you know, just like all this stuff like kind of came off her belt. And she's also a violinist in the orchestra because we wanted to always put out to people within the group the buy-in. Like if you mm. want more buy-in, here's a position that you can have more buy-in with. That's great. Uh, so she's, she's turned out to be a revelation for us. I mean, she did her master's, I want to say, or her doctorate in like music administration and, and, and also like performance. I mean, she's just like the perfect prototype for what we were doing. Um, so she was kind of our next major hire. And then we hired just recently uh, a woman named Laura Quinlan, who founded and started and ran for 30 years the Rhythm Foundation in Miami, which was a presenting organization for world music. And they're like looked at as like one of the most well-respected organizations in South Florida. And they just been doing things before people were doing things. You know, they were bringing over artists from countries that you would never imagine uh, before anyone else was and and they've been providing really amazing experiences for miami for 30 years and she just has this wealth of knowledge and she was retired and she just came to us and was like hey is there any help i can provide you guys wow. we're like wow you know and she's so well respected she's so smart she can help sam with contracts and artists she can help derek with budgets and grants she can help you know me with art you know she just kind of has her hands and everything she knows artists she knows managers she knows people she knows spreadsheets she knows quickbooks she knows all these things that like are amazing um and uh she has the experience of doing it so for 30 years and wow. she loves the vision of what we're providing so she was kind of like she, we we originally were thinking maybe an operations kind of person to come in and take a huge load off of Derek, but like we thought of her as a stopgap, but now she's turning into this other role that's like really filling in a lot of different places. And then Derek can kind of learn from her a little bit, even though she answers to Derek, she's been around for 30 years and, you know, she can talk to Sam and come from, she has this, she has gravitas, you know, like yeah. she, she's got the experience and, and, and she comes from a very loving place. So she can give us ideas about venues in Miami and people. I mean, she's just she's unbelievable. So and then, you know, also like kind of collaborating with other institutions like we've become the orchestra and residents of the Adrian Arch Center. So they provide us a huge enormous financial boost and help when we're there performing it's a very expensive space it's a union hall but they subsidize you know some of our rent there they pay for it to have us there as in residence they want us to grow into that hall and develop ourselves there um arts for learning is another smaller institution that handles a lot of education and outreach for you know different projects and different people and now we're going to partner with them on our education concerts so oh, cool. they basically are going to admin some of our education concerts and possibly now we're starting a, a new deco junior which is a, a youth orchestra that we're piloting in may are you calling it that uh, maybe new deco i junior like it <laughs> yeah yeah we want to keep new deco the name to yeah. get kids you know like hey we're part of new deco but i think junior is like a, and we're also going to be doing some really we've, we're floating around the ideas of maybe actually paying the kids you know so it's 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 Ooh. really we're trying to think of things in very unique and dynamic ways but um 
you know, the librarian, the personal manager, Laura's coming in number two, teaming with Arts for Learning. These have been like very organic things that have happened that are helping us with the capacity because, you know, at one point in time, Sam last year was like just not sleeping. He was either writing or or dealing with the day to day. I mean, he's he's the CEO of the organization. So ultimately he has the final say of, you know, finances and he's keeping things in line and it's a lot to manage all the time. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and uh, I know you he know, just had a baby, so on top of yeah, all that, and then sucks. not sleeping, yeah. so that's crazy. Yeah, that's he doesn't crazy. sleep at all anymore. This guy's like, he's like, kind of like a machine. So uh, <laughs> That's insane. That's cool. Yeah. And so, like, so with all that help, like, let's go back to the guest artist thing, because that's the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, because I saw one time, well, you know, I follow you on Instagram, and I saw that you were in Europe scouting people for guest artists I think that's what you were doing and you yeah. was that last year yeah just bringing you finding people I'm sure that now other people tell you you got to work with this person you got to work with that person so how how has that evolved because probably at first you were like oh I'll work with this 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 person and now probably that you're becoming bigger and more well known people are probably contacting you which is totally different because then you have to be like, does this person fit? Is this what we're looking for? Is this what we want? So how are you navigating all of that? Um, yeah, again, that's been very organic. We obviously, when we first started out, we just were really kind of cold calling managers and agents and, mm -hmm. and seeing who would take a bite. And, you know, we had a few little videos that kind of got some uh, traction um, and some people that were interested. And, and we just had a really kind of, lucky run of artists from any everyone from like Bilal to Kishibashi uh you know they they those those people kind of put us out there in a way that showed that we're a really safe place to collaborate with and we could do some really great stuff um I would say even Kishi's concert our very first concert with Kishi in 2016 that video we made after that kind of I mean, it didn't go viral. It just it just put us in a place where, like, whoa, this orchestra is really dynamic, unique, and special, and mm -hmm. incredible, and 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 it was captured in such a beautiful way that I think a lot of people kind of saw that and were like, okay, and so people were like we're now listening a little more and wanting to check us out. And then we had this incredible run last year, our season three, where we got to work with Ben Folds and Jacob Collier and yeah. uh, Emily King and Luke James and Time for Three, and so there was this huge gamut. Of, of eclecticism and the artists we worked with. And, and don't get me wrong, it was like not easy to get Jacob Collier, it was not easy to get these people, but Sam, you know, Sam has really taken the lead on being the contacts with the managers and, uh, you know, making me offers and, and sending out emails and videos. And, and he, you know, he's doing it in a great way. And, and I think last year brought enough managers and enough attention to us that now people are pushing like this season everyone has been pushing certain artists on us sam took a trip to la this summer i couldn't be with him there at the time but he got to meet some of the top people at these agencies who saw what we were doing and now they're going to come and visit us in miami and see what we're you know that's great who we're going to be working with and we have an incredible incredible roster of artists this year that's going to be like so mind-blowing like and and it really has come organically so it went from us looking you know and we go to like Tiny Desk and Audio Tree, and we, mm -hmm. we look at all the up and coming people, but you, get a, you still have to get through an agent and a manager, and those those sometimes can be tough if you don't have the relationships. Now we have enough relationships with people who, at, at these agencies and these companies, William Morris, Red Light, who can talk to their friend and say, "Hey, you should really check this out. These guys are no joke. I saw them live. Blah 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 blah." Yeah. And then it just becomes a different thing now. The conversation is more like, "Is a collaboration right? Not will you please come work with us?" Right. Right. Yeah, that's a different question to ask. And I'm really glad that you clarified earlier that um, it wasn't just a walk in the park to get some of these people because they're big names, right? Jacob Collier. So, yeah, <laughs> reaching out to him, I'm sure, took a while get to get an answer Good. and to get and people also, to have a look. And also, you know, some of these musicians that are in our group now, like this, you know, I, I really consider us a hybrid ensemble now. And a lot of our rhythm section guys, they're in their own bands. And they do their own thing. For example, our drummer, Armando, who's the sickest, nastiest, most amazing in-the-pocket um, drummer I, you could ever imagine. He's just a brilliant artist. And his his buddy, Jason Matthews, who's the guy who plays um, uh, the Moogs and the Scents and the Rhodes, they, they have been working with Sam on some of the arrangements. And they're just really brilliant guys. But they're in their own bands uh called electric kiff and twin and and they play festivals and you know they met quincy jones this summer and they were touring europe so they 
they see artists and they know artists and Jason just sent us a list one day. He's like, yo, these are all super dope people you should check out. Like really mm. up and coming indie kind of people who would be perfect with us, but aren't past the point of like being able to collaborate with a group like ours. You know, they're like right. in that range of, you know, if you have zero to a hundred percent, like this being like Beyonce ultimate celebrity and zero is someone who's just starting out. We want someone in that 40% range, maybe 50% range. It's like not quite, tip the scale to where they're so popular they'll be crazy out of control expensive but at the same time they're still building their career and yeah those are kind of that like pocket of artists we've been looking at yes but you know what i find i find so thrilling about that is personally i love finding maybe it's like the love of the underdog or something but i love finding someone who hasn't hit it big yet literally i love finding that person because if they are good i'm like I discovered that person. Like, there's some, like, extra little satisfaction of being like, I discovered that person. They're not famous yet, but they will be, you know? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's just, it's it's pretty cool that you get to bring these people out on your platform and say, you know, we discovered each other and now we're collaborating. It's it's It almost feels like you're growing your family one person at a time. That's, like, the vibe Definitely. I get, seriously, through your social media. So you should be happy about that yeah. because that is a good that is a good energy to be coming from you know from your message messaging and your videos and your posts essentially i think yeah and personally and i and, and i think sam has his own journey within it we, we both have had a journey we've had a collective journey a shared journey then our individual journeys and i think for me what I've been trying to do more and more of is surrendering to the process and surrendering mm. to the opportunities and surrendering myself a bit and not being so like rigid about how I think a piece should go or how I think what art, you know, what art, just like really being open to the idea of like, is this person a great artist and can we elevate them together and all be elevated? Yes. And I think that, that as my leadership has grown, I, I know that that's something that's really helped me be more open to, to the ideas of, of different collaborators. And, and even like, you know, when, when these guys were giving us names, I'm like, ah, you know, who are these? you know, it's like my first reaction <laughs> was like, it's not mine. Oh. And what I've had to realize is New Deco is not mine. It's it's everybody's now. And, and it's it was an idea that, sure, it started out with Sam and I, but now it's bigger than Sam and I will ever be. It's going to live way past me. It's going to live... Mm. But probably can live past me further than it could live past Sam at this point. But at some point in time, he and I are going to be able to walk away and it's going to be its own entity. Like, you know, something like the New World Symphony, you know, MTPT right. is eventually not going to conduct it. And it's going to be its own beautiful entity after time. Right. Um, you know, Boston Pops, Arthur Fiedler, right? He started that thing, but and now it's its own entity, you know. And so New Deco is really going to be that at some point. And. Could it survive with Sam without Sam and I right now? Maybe not, but I, I can see down the road that it could. And we, you know, we want to open it up to other uh, conductors and collaborators and all that kind of stuff. But you know, the idea that it's more for everybody and it's it's beyond us, it's beyond ego, it's beyond what I want is is initially what I thought it was going to be. Uh, is allowing us to really accept certain opportunities when they come. And, and sometimes those opportunities are just like unbelievable. You know, you just don't know what an artist is going to bring until they show up. Mm. And, you know, one example was Luke James we had last year. You know, we had an artist kind of cancel on us a little bit last minute. And we, we brought in this guy, Luke James, who was shared the same manager of Emily King. And he saw Emily King's concert said, I think this guy would be great. And I listened to his music. And I'm like, eh, you know, and I saw a live piece of him singing. I'm like, whoa, he's really good. And then he came, and he was lights out. He was just wow. like, everyone was like, ah, you know. And, and so that was me surrendering to a moment that I lost control of, or at least thought I lost control of. But really, by letting go and surrendering to the process, we ended up having a really epic and special and beautiful experience with this guy that, you know, I'll remember forever. It was, it was incredible. And people are still talking about it, you know, because it was the last concert of the season, and everyone's like, whoa. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's incredible. You know, so better, would you yeah. say would you say that like would you say that was unexpected for you to learn that like that that surrendering yes. was because yes. because I have my own personal journey too. I mean, I've yes. been doing a lot of meditation and more yoga and yeah. and I'm I'm learning I'm learning there's a lot of like really deep philosophical things that I've been craving and wanting in my life that are now affecting my music making and and mm -hmm. it's it's with our Amarillo and New Deco and it was well once again. So, um, yeah, those things are, 
they were unexpected. They, they've, yeah. they've come along in a way that have changed me for the positive. That's so great. Yeah, because I, I, I don't know, recently I've discovered, <laughs> what's your dog doing? Something bad? She's trying to get up on the couch. <laughs> you got to stay on the bed. Okay, boo-boo, stay on the bed. <laughs> on your bed. One of the things I've been noticing lately is that I have to embrace the process because if I don't, I'll just be so much more unhappy, you know, like surrendering to what could come of something that I don't, that I don't actually know is going to come in the future. And there's no way of knowing that, you know? And so that sounds like you've really been able to tap into that through your yoga practice and your meditation practice. So, um, I want to hear more about that because you did touch on it on the first episode that you were into yoga, but it sounds like you've just kept at it and, how has that evolved? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, yoga is breath and breath is presence and presence is being alive, is really in the moment. And, and when you're present and you're in the moment, you're actually existing in the, re in the now and, and that's where everything exists. I think for yoga, for me, has developed over the years in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's a physical activity, sometimes it's a mental activity, sometimes it's an emotional activity. But it always has been something that really grounds me, keeps me healthy, and it's a lifestyle. It's beyond the mat. You know, it's it's carrying the lessons that you learned on the mat, off the mat, both mm -hmm. in health and food and nutrition and how you sleep and how you take care of yourself and your relationships with friends and people, acquaintances. It's it's all encompassing. It's not just I'm a yoga when I walk yogi when I walk into the yoga studio. I'm a yogi when I walk out, and it's a, it's kind of like a way of life for me at this point. From you know, like I said, everything from food to how you take care of yourself, yeah. both mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And then that led to other things. I, I do a lot of meditation now, and I'm very deep into meditation and chanting and mantras. And, and, and these things have really grounded me spiritually, grounded me emotionally to make really great decisions and really think things thought out and have more empathy for others and, you know, come from a place of a higher self where, you know, the lower self, the ego is, is constantly bickering and wanting and and needing and necessitating and conjoling and the higher self is 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 coming from a place where how can I serve and what what is my best opportunity to give back to something else and what does this moment deserve what, what, what how can I serve it how can I heal it how can I help it mm. and then that place is where you can really like tap into some like magical moments and you know I've had situations where there's been maybe someone in an orchestra or something with an orchestra that's like not gone my way or I wasn't happy about, but you know, I've told myself come from a higher place, still go do the job and, and give back because ultimately it's the audience that we're there for. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm there for the musicians too. I want them to have a great experience, but we're, we're servants to our community. We're servants to the art that we love. And if we don't come from that space of giving back and serving and providing, then what are we doing? I mean, we're a nonprofit, you know, it's, and, and I think that's where classical musicians sometimes get a little bit confused. They, you know, classical music is like a, a very closed society. It's a very, it's like a, a it's a, it's like, like a closed can club, you know, like if you're not in a club, who are you? And, you know, and that's, mm. that's the problem with classical music is it alienates itself unwillingly. And, you know, it doesn't mean to, it just, right. it, 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 it it creates this atmosphere that like we are holier than now and and honestly we're not we're just people who've studied this niche thing that's very cool and certain people love it and it's very powerful but it doesn't mean we're not servants to the institution nor are we not servants to the community with which we are providing what it is we're providing for and and uh, you know when you come from this serving place this healing place this giving back place um for me it's a lot more rewarding and a lot more um satisfying to see things done and, and, and have people react. And then, you know, the, the moments of gr gratitude I feel or humility I feel come after when I'm speaking to the audience members or speaking to the people who are there. And then they're like telling me their experience. And that's like, this is why we did it. You know, mm. Cause it's going to change you and change this. And, and, and that's been much more rewarding than like how many orchestras can I conduct and what is the best orchestra I can get in front of And Oh, I want this manager over here and I want to, conduct this orchestra over there and you know it's it's gonna happen when it's supposed to happen if it is gonna happen and and yeah. i think the more i improve on my craft the more i improve on my leadership the more i improve on 
you know, everything that I need to do to build my musical foundation, my conductor foundation, as well as my leadership foundation, then it's all going to come, you know, and, yeah. and I don't, I don't have this like fear or feeling like it's, it's not happening because it is happening. I'm busy. I'm looking at my schedule. I'm right. like, look at my year. It's, it's insane. And, right. and it's only going to get more insane as long as I keep doing great work. The only point it's going to stop is if I like give up and, and lose perspective. So, um, you know, trying to keep a healthy amount of ego, of course, but also with this humility and gratitude for what is. And, you know, meditations really help that. Sweet. And then what about Amarillo? How do you have time to do that? I mean... I don't. I'm studying <laughs> Italian symphony right now, and I'm going, oh my gosh, it's Wednesday, and I still need to get through the symphony more. Um, yeah. Amarillo is a little different in that, you know, the investment there was really front end. So, like, the first couple seasons was kind of just shoring everything up, you know. It, it, you know, the the organization was, was going through, you know, um, some issues, and I needed to come in and, and get the programming on track. Um which I did and changed up, and, and I, I really listened to the community, and I think we have really great balance. We hired a new executive director a couple of years ago who's really smart. He came from the Atlanta Symphony, and he just really, like, shored up a lot of the finances and the institution itself. And so we've really kind of grown together in the last three or four years in Amarillo to the point where we're selling out concerts all the time. Our donorship wow. is up. Our season subscriptions are up. You know, the concerts artistically are as high as they've ever been. Um, we're really firing on all cylinders and we know the steps and processes we need to do to get there. So it's, in some ways, it's my least amount of, I wouldn't say effort. It's just like the off podium stuff we've gotten really managed. So I know exactly what I need to do, when I need to do it, how I need to do it. And then we, 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 we put myself in situations to make sure I'm able to get the work done, but I'm not overloaded. New Deco is like all encompassing from the moment I turn my phone back on at 9am every day, it's ringing, it's clicking and Sam and I talk a couple times a day, Derek and I talk a couple times a day, but, um, you know, it's cause it's basically like a startup in a way. So, yeah. Um, whereas Amarillo is very institutionalized and we, and we exactly. have a very set thing I have to do, which is something I also like about being a music director. It's like, once you get to that point where you're institutionalizing everything, you know what you need to do to keep things firing. Then you just, then you just be, stay creative. And that, that's the right. fun place for me is to, it's just to be creative and not worry about, is this program going to sell tickets? Well, they're going to trust me now. You know, is right. this, are we going to have enough money to finish the season? You know, like that is stuff that, <laughs> you know, knock on wood, we're not worrying about anymore. Yeah, no, I hear you. That's awesome. So, so that's so great. So like, what do you, what's, what do you have coming up next? Like, I know there's so many things, you have so many irons in the fire. Um, what do you, what are your next goals? Have you thought about that? Oh, you mean like personally long-term? Yeah. Yeah, um, there's a lot, you know, uh, things are shifting for me internally. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm changing as a human, I'm evolving. And yeah. I think my, the things that provide me the most reward and comfort aren't the same things they were 10 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, even five years ago. But, you know, what I would love to see continue to happen is New Deco to develop and, and us to be a major player on the main stage, on the world stage. I, I you know, of course, I'd be... You know, I'd, I want to release multiple albums. I'd love to win Grammys. I think that'd be just awesome, amazing. But, you know, those are sort of like external rewards. I think just having the group be incredibly successful and meaningful in this community and in Miami where I'm from and have it just take on a life of its own where it's just an institutionalized thing, I think that would be just like the ultimate the ultimate leave behind legacy that I could, could have for it. Um, and then, yeah, I, you know, I have my own personal desire to grow as an artist, to grow as a conductor. And I think getting in front of bigger and better orchestras is going to help that. So obviously having the opportunity to conduct the national symphonies and maybe some other, you know, I'm conducting San Francisco symphony this year for the first time. Oh, really? And, awesome. Yeah. That's going to be really exciting. Um, you know, I've got subscriptions in Singapore and in Fort Worth. So these are all like new series and new orchestras that I'm going to be able to develop and work with. And I think I'm just going to grow from there and, and hopefully build off of that. And, and, and I think that's exciting to me. It's like having that mix of here's my group, here's my classical group, here's my very forward thinking group. And here's, you know, then there's orchestras like Grand Rapids where I do series with, I'm going back to do an art prize uh, collaboration with Earshot and, and Grand Rapids Symphony where I do a lot of new music and we do it in a like really old school, like torn out ballroom. It has this very eclectic Ooh, urban cool. feel. Yeah, it's really, really interesting. And so 
you know, projects like that with the orchestras are really exciting for me. Sarasota, I do a lot of work with them and on a certain series, The Great Escapes, and I get to do like really kind of like crossover new music stuff. So as long as I'm like feeling creative and, and have a good relationship with the artistic team of an institution, then it's it's very rewarding for me to have a relationship with them. So while I have three or four orchestras that I continually work with, I'm also very excited about expanding and, and meeting other orchestras. And I think ultimately I'd love to have another classical music director job after Amarillo that's mm. that's going to be a, a, an artistic leap forward and, and allow me to, uh, you know, grow as not only a conductor and artist, but provide the kind of energy and expertise and excitement that I can to that community and, and help build them and, and make them more relevant. And I think the right orchestra is going to come at the right time and, and, yeah. and we're gonna have a marriage that's going to be really wonderful. It's just, what's the next one? You know, that's the one that's kind of the big question mark. Um, yeah. I'd love to dip my toe more in Europe. You know, I flirted with a manager last summer, a European manager. It ultimately didn't work out, but I think um, having the opportunity to conduct in Europe would be really something that I've, I've dreamed about and would love to have happen. So kind of more the same, but just kind of going three-dimensionally through it, like right. going different avenues and, and seeing where it all grows to. So cool. Okay, I have two more two more questions for you. Um, who Who's really inspiring you right now? And I'm not going to just say classical musician, but like artist, musician. I mean, you've, you've mentioned a lot of people who are inspiring you right now, but could you... Is there someone that comes to mind that is really, really giving it to you right now, like inspiration wise? <laughs> yeah, uh, there's so many amazing artists. I think what Robert Glasper is doing right now is, is incredible. He's a jazz pianist, but he also does a lot of stuff in the hip hop world. Uh, Augustine Green, his album is incredible with Common. Jacob Collier, I think, mm. is probably Mozart Reborn. Um, oh, God. His brain and mind and energy and enthusiasm are unbelievable. He worked with us last year. We did a concert, and it was one of the most inspiring, incredible things I've ever been a part of. I mean, he's his energy is infectious. He's a gift to humanity. He's so down to earth. He's so talented. He's like... He's like open platform. He doesn't hide anything. He has all these videos online showing you how he's writing music, but you just can't stay up with him because his mind is in yeah. such a unique, special place. He's just, uh, I, I, he's a genius without a doubt. He's a genius. Uh, he's a musical genius, but he's also, his ears are incredible. He's basically rewriting harmony and rewriting mm -hmm. theory as we know it. Um, and you know, all the big cats respect him. I mean, Quincy Jones and right. And Did you see that video Hancock. that he explains harmony? I think it's with Quincy Jones. That was with uh, Herbie Hancock. Oh, Herbie Hancock, yes. Herbie Hancock. He explains it to kids and then yep, yep. The schoolers and then college musicians and then professionals and then Herbie's the last one and everyone's just like, okay, you know. And he's just it's so he's incredible. Probably one of the most inspirational people I've ever been around. But, you know, on, you know, on a different way, like, uh, you know, there's like Luke James is very inspiring. He's a singer, songwriter, R&B kind of guy, soul kind of guy, but he's also an actor. And I'm like really inspired by that. Um, you know, uh, I'm inspired by Sam, his growth and where he's gone, like his leadership, his style and skills as he's grown is, inspires me to be a better leader. Um, you know, musicians in our orchestra, they're so talented and so badass. Like I just kind of, I'm always inspired by them. And, and a lot of musicians in the orchestra are now writing music and we're arranging the music for new deco too. So oh, like, that's so great. So, so all this collaborative energy is really feeding into the classical musicians as well. Yeah. That's oh, great. for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's the kind of energy I want to take around to other orchestras. And, yeah. You know, you gotta be humble and you gotta like stand your ground and know what you want. But at the same time, like, when a musician is firing all cylinders and feel like they're in it, it, there's something, there's some real beauty in that. And it's hard to get there. And I get it. You know, class musicians sometimes have a slog and the season is long and mm -hmm. sometimes they're asked to do things they don't really want to do. But you know what? This is the life you chose and this is the orchestra you're in. And, and like you, you either fight it or you go with the flow with it. And, and, and until you get onto the admin side or the leadership role side, you're just not going to know how difficult it is to make an orchestra survive. And, and musicians, classical musicians should be walking into the job every day and going straight to management or the education and outreach department saying, what can I do to help? Who, what donor do you need me to talk to? 
who can I go out and, you know, like I had the idea of like giving musicians like a kickback if they brought in a new donor, you know, if someone brought in a donor, or at least intro and that person ended up giving money, then why shouldn't they get like a 10% kickback? Hell you know? yeah. Like, do you do that with new Deco? Um, I think we, we take care of people when we need to, but, but like, that's awesome. Not, that is an incredible idea. That's an yeah, incredible like, idea. I, like just give people more say and give people more. Yeah reason to go out and like you know like this whole like keep the musicians here keep the donors there oh, I hate it. And the management I hate it. like decides who to put you know like musicians yeah. donors should be talking all the time because that's what the donors want and that's what the musicians want and that's who the donors are inspired by and yeah. so but you know what like the, the the leadership that you're that you're showing right now and expressing is that of of allowing and and surrendering. And I don't think that there's always leaders like that, unfortunately. And I, I think that everyone has a lot to learn from you as far as that, because if that was, I do, I do think that because if there was, if there was more of that in the higher up situation, then it could foster a community of musicians who felt like their, their um, say actually mattered. And that's, actually, I think that's the future of classical music. If it were to continue in the way that it's set up now with Orchestra management here, donors here, musicians here. Everyone's separate in yeah. their own little, um, you know, their own little spaces, separated, yeah. and and then one person controls all of it, like the puppet master. Instead of integrating and and being a family, like like what you're creating at New Deco, I mean, I just think I think that is the future. Seriously, it, it it's we're yeah, we're here and that's there, so it'll take a while, but. It's it's the whole us versus them mentality, yeah. you know, and and uh -huh. I think both musicians and administrators are at fault. No one, it's not yes. one side or the other. Oh, absolutely. Musicians, musicians, they're so quick to just be trivial and say, ah, oh, they're doing this. They're trying mm -hmm. to take money away. They're trying to do that. And well, you know, the other side, some administrators are trying hard not to let the orchestra sink. But then there's also like the administrators when the musicians come in and have these ideas. They're like, oh, I don't want to hear that. It's not my idea. You know, right, it's right. like. It's this us versus them mentality that every time I feel that energy, I try to stop it. Like, well, you know, they have this and they do that. I'm like, ah, you know, like I, there's no us versus them. What can I do to help you? You know, like right. I, I, I try to nip it as soon as it pops up because it's it's a cancer. It's a cancer in our industry that's that people don't talk about and people don't know. It's like agreed. We are our own worst enemies, and mm -hmm. and and I, it's everyone's at blame, from CEOs to administrators to musicians to to everyone. It's always us versus them, and and I like strive as hard as I can to like take away that, you know. And even in Amarillo, it's I, I people are like, oh, you're trying to do this and you're trying to do that and you're trying to do this, and I'm like, no, I'm not. You know, like look at the look at the facts. You know, like. Mm -hmm. I had someone once say to me a year ago, like, yo, you're just firing everybody and trying to get rid of people in the auction. I'm like, I've been here five years and I have not fired anybody. Like, I haven't, you know? Mm -hmm. And sure, I've had some tough conversations and I've had to bring people in to, like, talk to them about artistry and, and commitment. And, and some of those conversations were better than others and some were tough. Um, some of those conversations led to people deciding to uh, leave the orchestra. Some of those conversations led to people kind of re-upping their energy toward the orchestra. It's, it all unfolds the way it's supposed to. And mm -hmm. But the reality is, is you want the best out of people. And, and um, you know, I, my goal is like get rid of somebody. I think initially when I first was starting out, I was like, oh, this person can't play with the skin or that person can't play with the skin. But like, you know, even Sam is like pushed on me sometimes, give this person a chance, give this person a chance. And, and I've generally been surprised when you do and you give someone wings to fly and, and have a moment to grow as tough as it is in the moment. And it may like bother you right then. The bigger picture is this person's going to be, you know, someone you would want to walk to the fire with. For example, our guitarist, he came into the ensemble and played like one piece with us. I want to say two years ago, two and a half years ago. And I was like, dude, Sam, we cannot have this guy. He has no idea how to follow a conductor. He doesn't know what he's doing. Blah, 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 blah. And Sam's so like, now give him a chance. He's an amazing reader. He's an amazing artist. He'll figure it out. And he wouldn't look at me. And I was so mad. I'm like, dude, you got to watch me. I'm giving you a B. He's like, I don't even know what your hands are doing. You know, he mm -hmm. kind of like had this flip out. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to trust the process. Trust the process. Gave him a few concerts. Gave him some more. Now this guy, I would walk through fire with him. I would do anything with this guy. Not only does he know how to watch and read and follow me in a way that's amazing, but he's one of the most intuitive, in tune people in the whole ensemble, always paying key attention to me. Same with our drummer, Armando. Like he's used to just like having his head down and beating in the drum and like being in yeah. it. 
now he's reading music and he and he, he looks at me and I just I just give him like a wink or like a look and he like he nods his head back like we're communicating in a way that's so like instantaneous like classical musicians kind of pick up on a stick he, we're, yeah. we're doing it through our eye. I mean it's just it's an unbelievable thing it and, reminds and it me of that Bernstein guys to get there. did you see that Bernstein video where he's like he like does the eyebrows and the he's conducting like a Haydn symphony it's like oh, yeah, that, yeah. you know, like they're just, everyone's in tune with each other. I love yeah. it. But you just had to yeah. sort of break the beast there. You had yeah. to, you had to stick with it. It sounds like with these people. Yeah. 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 Break the beast. Yeah. That's, you know, you just had to like overcome your own fears and your own. Right. Again, you have to keep giving yourself up a bit, you mm -hmm. know, and, and maybe that's a new paradigm for what a conductor or a leader is, uh, you know, in terms of like, the old school, like sort of, I am the man in charge or woman in charge, like that, that, that works and it's not wrong. It's just, I think personally you get the best out of people when they feel free and when they totally. feel creative and when they feel they're, they can give what they can give and you're going to accept it. You know, if someone feels like pressured or singled out, they're not going to give you the best. Right. You know, even me, like if someone comes and critiques me or something from the back, I'm like, Ooh, then I start thinking too much about it. It's like, I am me, you know, I'm like, I'm going to always work on my craft and there's going to be things I can do to get better, but I'm not really going to like do a 180 point change. I'm not like, you know what I mean? Like right. if people, it's orchestra. It's, I think sustainability for conductor in a lot of ways is generally dependent on how orchestras feel about you. I mean, it's simple as that. If they feel good about you, you're going to come back. If they don't feel good about you, you're not going to come back. It's right. That you could be, you could be a genius in your own mind about how this chord relates to that chord and where it's going, and, and it, you can just that's going to appeal to a certain musician for sure. But at the end of the day, they're walking home, they're going home to their kids and their wives and their bills and their things, and they they're either going to go home going, "That was a fun concert, I really enjoyed it," or man, that person was a this or a that. What a terrible, how do they get these conductors? You know, like, yeah. I don't want that conductor, you know? Yeah. Uh, not that I'm here to make people in the orchestra happy. That's not my goal. But I have a job to do, and they have a job to do. So why not make that job not only easy and, and fun, but at the same time, like, coming from a place of real dedication on both ends. And, and it, it takes both, you know, everyone has to give up a little bit of themselves. Like musicians have to go, okay, okay, let's see what this person's got. Musicians are really quick to judge. Mm. I mean, I was the same way. Doctors <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, are really quick to judge, but you got to be open. You got to be open. Yeah. And that's probably one of the biggest, the one of the biggest um, things that conductors uh, deal with. And the, one of the biggest challenges is, is how much do you stay true to yourself and what the kind of work that you really want to get through, as well as keeping people happy? If you go one way too much or the other way too much, you're going to piss people off regardless, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, you're not going to make everybody happy. Yeah, you can't. Sure. You can't. But you can be authentic and be really authentic. And if you're really authentic in it, and people really feel that, you're going to get you're going to get called back. You're going to get you're going to get to go back and do the gigs, you know. Totally. Um, so, yeah. 100%. So, tell 100%. me 100%. So, tell me the last <laughs> thing that I want to know. What do you have coming up that you want to promote? Oh, that I want to promote. Um, I mean, new deco wise, we're about to announce our season, so that's really exciting. We have an album in a can that we're going to be putting together and releasing soon. That's really exciting. Sweet. Um, so I'd love to have people just, you know, join our mail. Was that the Kickstarter campaign? Because I joined that, so I'm going to get oh, did one. You? Yeah, so I want to get it. I'm going to. Yay, thank you for that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we're doing a lot of editing right now on the music. So cool. that's one of the goals I have to do today is start editing some more of the, the, the stuff. But I'm um, going to put all these links in the show notes so people can be on on top of what you're doing in New Deco so they can see the new season, so they can find out about your album. So I'll make sure I have all those links um, for that. When does the, When's the first concert of New Deco? The concert, the first concert of the series is in October. I believe it is like middle of October. So we're about nice. to announce, we're about a week away from announcing the season. It's a little late, but you know, I think for us, we've learned that like, you know, late is not necessarily a bad thing. Right. You know, orchestra's always planning way ahead. We, we still don't have all the artists lined up. It's just, 
you know, classical music works a certain way, pop artists and uh, non-classical artists work another way, you know, they're, they're hedging their gigs on a week to month basis, whereas right. classical artists are hedging their gigs on a year to year basis. So there's a little bit of play and a little bit of flexibility we have to be available for. And I think our community understands that. I think we've even announced last year, I think we announced the Lightbox series and still didn't have a guest artist for the last concert. And so it was okay. Our Lightbox series sold out in like three days. So Sweet. That's awesome. You know, it, it worked out, you know. It worked yeah. Out, so. Awesome. Well, thank so, you yeah. so much. Thank you for coming back on Repeat Guest Action. I love it. <laughs> and... And I just love everything you do. I love watching you on social, and it's so much fun to see how everything's going with you. So thank you so much, Jacques, and I really appreciate it. You're welcome, Tracy, and I'm, I'm excited for your podcast and the growth that you've achieved, and I love seeing what you're doing, and it's great that we have a community of people helping each other out because that's what we need. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>